Welcome back to another video guys. Today I'm gonna to be going over seven common mistakes and bad habits that I always see new Java programmers making. Now whether or not you're a seasoned vet or you're brand new to Java, you might find that you're doing one of these things that I highly advise against. Um, these are just seven examples. There are many more than these. If there's one that you think I should have covered and didn't in this video, you can comment it down below. But I'm probably gonna make a follow-up to this video with maybe seven, maybe 10 more common mistakes that Java new Java programmers make if this video does well. So let me know in the comment section whether or not you like this type of content. And without further ado, let's get right into the video. And number one, we've got a pretty simple one and that's Boolean Zen. Now, even though this is simple, I still see it all the time from new programmers. And if you don't know what Boolean Zen is, is essentially when you compare Booleans using equality. For example, let's say I had some condition here that just returns a value, a Boolean value based on some properties about the uh, the system. Um, and let's say I have a Boolean variable here called check that holds the value of that condition. What I'll see a lot of new programmers do is something like if check equals equals false, do something, or if check equals equals true, do something. Similarly, placing the conditional value itself in the if statement is another form of Boolean Zen. You're gonna to wanna to replace these with the conditions themselves. If already takes a Boolean, so you don't need to reevaluate the Boolean with equality. Another thing in the same vein is Boolean Zen. I see a lot of people do is, rather than returning the Boolean conditions themselves, they'll do a check and then explicitly return true or false. Again, better way to do this is to just return the condition itself. This will go a long way to simplify and decomplexify the code you're writing and also just make you look like a better programmer that knows what they're doing. Next up, we have unnecessary use of else statements and not inverting your conditionals. So if, if you take a look at this example here, let's say we check some condition, then we wanna do some work and return a value. In this case, we're just returning true, it doesn't really matter. Else, we just wanna like return something or do a few steps and then let's say return some other object. Now, the first thing is, this else statement is unnecessary and creates unnecessary nesting. So one of the first fix here, we're gonna remove the else and simply have our else block be the secondary to the if statement. Now let's say we have much more to do if the if statement is true rather than it's false. In that case, rather than having more code indented, let's invert the if statement so that we have less nesting and more readable code. This is actually a common mistake I see a lot of new pro programmers do, not in such a simple example like this, but they'll have significant nesting that can easily be decoupled by just inverting a lot of those if statements. Now, even if our method is void, but we want to separate the blocks based on some condition, we can just utilize an empty return. Again, this is a better option than if elsing or nesting in some other way. So the next newbie habit I see new programmers basically doing by default is overutilizing vanilla for loops instead of using streams. So I've actually made an entire video on Java streams, which you can find by clicking on the title card above. And I highly recommend watching that because I go in depth on how streams work, what they're meant for, why they were added to Java. And I do a little bit of testing on like their performance characteristics. So if you're interested, uh, go watch that video and come back. Also, I'll give you guys a quick example here. Uh, on what I'm talking about. So let, let's say we have to create this simple method where we're given a dictionary of data, of words, and the counts of how many times that th that word appeared in like, let's say an essay or something. And our goal is to turn this dictionary or this map of string to integers into a list of strings where we just concatenate the number of times that word appeared to the word itself. But also we need to satisfy some condition. Let's just say that we only want words that appeared more than twice. The naive way to solve this would be to first, let's say instantiate a list of strings, then to use a for each loop. For those of you that don't know, the elements inside of a map are called entries. And if you wanted to loop over a map, you could loop over its entry set. Depending on the type of map, the ordering might be a little weird though of the elements. Next, we'll check our count condition on each entry. And if it's satisfied, we'll append to our list. However, I just as I just discussed previously, we're unfortunately following into one newbie habit here, and that's not inverting our if statement. So ideally, we can actually rewrite this by inverting the condition here. 
and skipping this iteration of our loop in the case where we don't satisfy the condition. That saves us one level of nesting. And of course we should be returning this, this value. But uh, we can do better than this, of course. So rather than using a for, although this actually is pretty nice looking code, rather than doing this at all, we should utilize the Java streams API. Instead, we'll take the entry set, stream over it, filter out any entries that don't satisfy our condition, map all of these entries to strings, and collect them back to a list. Of course, as I discussed in the other video, we, the benefit we gain from this is, is the readability. Since these streams are declarative, it's very clear what we're doing. We're obviously filtering based on our condition, mapping to a string concatenation, and, and mapping it back to a list. Uh, as opposed to having written this out procedurally where you'd have to, or a reader would have to actually kind of trace the code in their head to understand exactly what's going on. So again, try to use streams when it's appropriate and where possible. And if you're not sure, uh, please go watch that video I made on it. So the next newbie mistake is just not inverting control of your while loop to the body of the while loop. Um, so what exactly I mean by that is having your entire condition for termination of your while loop exist just in the declaration of the while loop. Uh, this is common when you're creating some sort of REPL. Uh, a REPL is a read eval print loop. So you, maybe you're interacting with the user and based on the user input, your while loop will do different things and call different methods and it will need to exit at some point based on user feedback. So what I suggest you do in order to clean up the way your code is written, rather than having some complex condition in the body of the while loop and having interior body logic that depends on those conditions to run like separate blocks of code, invert the logic of the while loop itself and specify precisely when you want to break. By writing your for loop like this, not only is it much easier to trace, it's also easier to debug um, because debugging a complex statement within your while loop can be extremely tedious. So I highly recommend if you have some complex conditions to continue looping, break them up into logical components and break at particular locations in the while loop because similarly, if you have a situation like this where you have an if and an else block that you want only to occur completely separately and let's say nothing else happens at the end of this while loop, then utilize continues to minimize nesting. This is a much more cohesive and procedural way to write complex while loops. At number five, we have not using string builders or string joiners to concatenate strings. So consider this example here where we want to create a string that contains all the letters from A to Z. And one way you might do that is start with an empty string and then loop over all the letters, the ASCII characters from A to Z and add them one by one to your string. This is actually an unnecessarily inefficient way to do this. Strings in Java are immutable. So every single time that we're doing this concatenation here, we're creating a brand new string. On the other hand, string builders or joiners or string buffers, those are actually mutable string data types, meaning concatenation won't create a totally new object and require you to free up more space for that object. As such, one example of writing this in a better manner would be to just use a string builder. We can do that like so, and then we can utilize its append method. And if we ever want to retrieve the string, we can just utilize its toString method, which is of course unnecessary in a system out print, which will implicitly call the toString of any object. Now, while the string builder is more efficient in this type of case where you're utilizing it within a for loop, it's not necessarily the case that you should be using this at all times. So like in this example, let's say I was going to just concatenate them in line. It's better to actually not use the string builder because the JIT compiler will actually optimize this for you and replace it with a string builder if it finds that that's optimal. So it's actually better to just let Java handle whether or not to optimize it in this case where you have it all on a single line instead of casting this to a string builder and appending them uh, with successive calls to append. Okay, so let the JIT compiler handle it in the case where you have inline string building. So number six, we have not utilizing a proper project structure, like package structure, slash using the default package. Now I opened up Eclipse here just to show you what that looks like in Eclipse. It's a little harder to see in IntelliJ. Also IntelliJ just does a better job of making sure this doesn't really happen. But here, as you can see, I just have my class in the default package, and this is just wrong. There's reasons why this is not a good idea, but you're gonna have to take my word for it that you're gonna to wanna to have a proper package structure when you're writing any sort of application 
or a code that you want to share with anybody. And especially if you're just going to use a single package for all of your code, you're going to be implicitly sharing all non-private variables across all instances of your code, which we'll talk a little bit more about in newbie habit number seven. Instead, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to break up your package structure into this typically accepted manner. And some development environments like IntelliJ might automatically do this for you, which is really nice, but others won't. Um, so you're going to want in your SRC package to have a main and a test package. And in your main and your test package, you're going to want a Java folder and a resources folder. And inside of your Java folder is where you're going to separate your packages into the various components of your application. And typically, it's good practice to do the same for your tests. So if my package that I have the newbie habits class in is called com sharp CS elegant code, I will do the same in my test class in my test package and have my tests mirror the code that I'm writing. So if I had another package here, let's say services and I had some class in there, let's say I say elegant service, then I would want to do the same thing in my tests and add an elegant service test to mirror the structure of my actual application. And our last newbie habit for this video is misusing or misunderstanding visibility modifiers in Java. So let's start with the first one, which is the public visibility modifier. Now, if you set something to public, then anything anywhere can utilize that object method or variable. So for example, here I have sharp service in this service package and in my main method, I can instantiate sharp service like so. Similarly, my elegant service is public. So I can also have an elegant service in my main method. Next up, we have the protected modifier, which gives us a little more privacy than the public modifier, but not by much. And I'll show you exactly why. Um, so let's say we have this inner class, this protected sharp service class, uh, because it's just a good way to demonstrate the level of protection that these modifiers give you. Um, at public, then our main method here, which has is not in the same package as the sharp service, and also isn't like a subclass of it, can access this protected sharp service class. Of course, it can't instantiate it, but it can at least access it. Now, if we were to set the, and also our elegant service, which is in the same package, but does not extend the sharp service, can also access the protected sharp service. Now, if we were to change this modifier from public to protected, then what we'd find is that our main method can no longer, or our main class can no longer access the protected sharp service because it's now outside of its scope, visibility scope, but the elegant service still can. Uh, and the reason for that is because there's a common misconception that protected means that all subclasses of your class can access that method. Now it is true. See, if I were to set make main a subclass of the sharp service, it is true that it would regain access to the protected sharp service. However, elegant service does not need to be a subclass of sharp service, but still has access. The reason for that is because what protected actually does is it gives access to anything in the same package as your class or any subclass of your class. And in fact, there isn't anything in Java that limits variables only to subclasses of a particular class. I see a lot of new Java programmers thinking that they can somehow limit a variable or a method to only subclasses of one of the classes they're making without realizing that actually everything in that package has access to it. The next visibility modifier is the default modifier, also known as package private. Now, what this does is it only allows classes in the same package as your class to have access to that class method or variable. So if we do this, for example, we'll see that in our main method, we once again lost access to the protected sharp service, despite the fact that we are a subclass of sharp service, but elegant service still retains access of the protected sharp service because it's in the same package, that being the service package. And lastly, we have the private visibility modifier. With the private visibility modifier, even if elegant service was a subclass of the sharp service, we see that it still has not does not have access to the protected sharp service class. That is because the, visibility, the private visibility modifier limits all variables, methods, and classes to be used only within the declaring class itself. So hopefully next time you're deciding on the visibility modifiers of the things inside of your classes, you have a little better idea of what it makes sense to use in what circumstances.
So I hope you guys found something useful in this video. These are just seven of the many, many newbie mistakes that new Java programmers uh, will often do. So I'll probably make some more follow-up videos discussing more mistakes, but hopefully one of these you found a little helpful and might change some of the habits that you've developed as you begin your journey or continue your journey as a Java programmer. Um, don't forget, of course, to like and subscribe to this channel if you found the content interesting. If you have some particular subject that you want me to cover, you can comment it down below. I'm happy to cover just about anything there is to do with Java or programming in general. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.